I'm Alex Lerner with Tuts Plus, and in this tutorial, I'm going to show you how to shrink your vinyl collection down into something more manageable. That is, we're going to turn our LPs into MP3s. The benefits of this are twofold. Firstly, and most obviously, this is going to allow us to listen to our record collections wherever we are. After all, strapping a turntable to your arm for your afternoon jog is likely to attract some unwanted attention. Second, with the backup of your record collection, you'll likely be able to sleep just a little bit easier. While I'm going to show you two ways to accomplish this, it's worth noting that both require a substantial amount of your time. It's not a difficult process per se, but it can be tedious. Both of these methods are just recording the output of your record player. Translation, that means you've got to allow one side to play through, flip the record, record the other side, and finally manually add your ID3 tags. All of this is to say that if you've got a large collection, this project might be best split over a weekend, or two. So, disclaimers aside, let's get started. Since we're recording a record collection, you know what would help? A record player. If you're in the market, you can kill two birds with one stone by picking up one with USB connectivity, like this one. It'll serve as a traditional record player with the added benefit of simple USB connection to your computer for easy recording. If you've already got a record player though, don't worry. As long as it's got an RCA out connection, we'll be able to use it. What's that you ask? RCA connectors are those little red and white ones that allow you to hook up your record player to your stereo, or in our case, a computer. To record a record player with an RCA connection to your Mac, you'll need an RCA to 3.5 millimeter adapter like this one. If you've got a newer Mac, like a Retina Display MacBook Pro or one of the skinny iMacs, You'll also need a cheap USB sound card like this. This will provide the audio in jack that those newer machines lack. Alright, so once you've decided whether you're going to use the RCA or the USB input to connect your turntable, it's a good idea to pause this video and get that connected. Got it? Good. Alright, let's start recording. So, without further ado, let's fire up GarageBand. We're going to start with an empty project like this. Now you'll see that GarageBand is asking what kind of instrument we're using. Despite the fact that a record player isn't exactly an instrument, we're going to have GarageBand treat it like it's a microphone. It's the default option, but if for some reason it's not already selected for you, do that here. Next, let's determine what input our record player is connected as. Click the right facing arrow next to the text that reads, My instrument is connected with. You can see this is open GarageBand's Audio MIDI Settings dialog. What we're concerned with here is the input drop-down box. If your record player is the only external audio device connected to your Mac, GarageBand will likely detect this and default to it. Either way, it's best to be safe rather than sorry. If you've got a USB turntable like me, it'll likely appear as something along the lines of USB microphone. No surprise there. Similarly, if you're using a turntable connected to your max line in jack, select line in. Now I swear, we're almost finished with the setup. All we need to do now is select whether or not you'd like to hear the instrument as you play and record. This is a total matter of preference, but I'll uncheck it for the purpose of demonstration. I'll click create, and you can see our new project has been created. Before we begin recording, I'm going to show you one trick that will absolutely prevent you from going crazy while you record. That is, by clicking this little button, we'll disable the metronome. For whatever reason, Apple has chosen to enable it by default, and for our uses, keeping it on would be nothing short of maddening. In the same spirit, GarageBand also enables something called Count In by default. We're going to turn that off. To do so, go to Record, Count In, and select None. Okay, great. Our turntable is connected, our project is set up, and the metronome is, well, off. Now all we have to do is hit record. Well, that, and of course we'll need to queue up our record. I recommend queuing up your record first and then hitting record on your Mac. There's generally a little silence in the beginning of records, which should be long enough for you to hit record on your Mac. So, let's do that. I'm going to queue up our record, and then I'm going to rush over to my Mac to hit record. As you can see by the waveform, our record has begun, well, recording. 
If the recording is too loud or too quiet, you can adjust it using this little slider to the left of the main recording interface. Moreover, to turn playback preview on or off, just enable or disable this tiny mute button as required. Once our record has been recorded into GarageBand, we can split up the individual songs or just export straight to iTunes. In the interest of time, I've already recorded a full record into another project which I'll use to show you how to split up the songs. So real quickly, I'll just open up that project. First, make sure Audio 1 track is selected. Next, we'll move the scrubber to the point where the songs change. Now actually finding the point where the songs change is a little bit difficult, but I've got a couple tips to help you out. So basically this is just going to be a game of guess and check. My first tip is look for a point where the waveforms change drastically. Like here. As you can see, the waveforms change from one height to another pretty abruptly, so that's a pretty good sign that the song is actually switched. But there's another way to find this as well. There's generally a quite small bit of silence in between each song on a record. By using either a pinching gesture on a trackpad or with this nearly invisible slider in the top right, we can gain a more detailed preview of our waveform to make sure we've selected the right track. Once we've found the point where the songs switch, hitting Command T will split the track into its own region. You can repeat that somewhat tedious process for every song on the record. When we finish splitting our tracks, it's time to export. Make sure you've selected the region containing your first track before we move on. We'll select Share in the menu bar, and then Song to iTunes. You could now give your track some proper metadata by filling in the artist, composer, album, and playlist fields, but GarageBand will make you fill in those fields for every song you export. Better to just wait and fill that information in through iTunes. That being said, it's always a good idea to fill out the title in GarageBand, since it's unique to each song. I'll do that now. We're also given the option to select the quality we'd like the song to output to. True audiophiles will likely opt for the uncompressed setting, but high or highest will sound fine to most. Now, here's the most important part. Make sure the box titled Export Cycle Area Only is selected. Otherwise, all our work splitting up the tracks will be for naught. Press Share, wait for the song to export, and voila, our song is now in iTunes. We're going to need to repeat this for every song on the record, however. For the sake of demonstration, I'll export one more track. I'll head back to GarageBand and this time select the sound region which corresponds to our second track. Again, we'll select Share and then Song to iTunes. We'll give our song its title and hit Share. Once more now, we just have to wait for GarageBand to work its magic and for the track to appear in iTunes. Now that we've got a couple songs in iTunes from the same album, let's give them the metadata they deserve. Navigate to your playlists, and then GarageBand. Here you can see all the tracks you've exported. Shift-click to select all the songs from a particular album, like so. Once you've chosen all the tracks from a particular album, we can go ahead and control-click on our selection. Next, choose Get Info. iTunes will ask us if we're sure we want to edit the information for multiple items. Feel free to select Don't Ask Me Again if you'd like. Now, just choose Yes. Now simply fill in the proper fields and hit Enter. And that's it. Now you're technically finished, but I'm going to show you one last trick before we call it a day. Within the Get Info window for your album, select Options. As its name suggests, this screen will provide us with a couple options to make our song sound a little bit better. If your recording is too quiet or too loud, check the box next to Volume Adjustment and adjust accordingly. Similarly, checking the box next to Equalizer Preset and choosing the preset for the genre that corresponds to your album will make your recording sound just a little bit better. Once you've applied those finishing touches, just click OK. You've just digitized your first record. 
It's a somewhat labor-intensive process, but the end product is absolutely worth it. With our songs in iTunes, you can now enjoy even the most obscure albums on the go with the confidence that they're backed up. I'm Alex Serena with Tuts Plus, wishing you a great time listening to your newly digitized albums.